if I was really look at, you know, you look at grains and carbs and look at how harmful trans fats are, um, hydrogenate oils, you know, think about it. It's what the, my computer is plastic. What is plastic? Plastic is liquid petroleum that we plasticize. We turn it into a solid object. That's what hydrogenization is. That's what trans fats are. They're partially plasticized liquids, right? That's insane. And you get those in your cells. It makes your cells not vibrate as well. It makes your receptors not work as well. If I was to pick one thing to work on first, it's going to be like sugar and oils. And it depends on the patient. If you're more inflamed autoimmune, I might do the sugars first. If you have gut issues, if you have more um, immune dysregulation issues, I might do more of the, the fats first, getting the healthy fats in, the bad fats out. But that's kind of where I start. And once you get the healthy oils and the bad oils out and you remove the sugar, then you start working on the, pro the next process level, which are all the grains, the carbs, the wheat, the, the soy, um, corn, you know. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. When it comes to food quality, there are just some foods that most people should avoid at all costs because it can impact your health and your overall energy. And in this episode with Dr. Aaron Hartman, we'll be discussing what are some non-negotiables when it comes to clean eating and what you can do to really make sure the quality of your food is as top-notch as possible. What's up, everyone? My name is Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. And Dr. Hartman actually reminds me a lot of some of the stuff that I like to do. He raises a bunch of his own food. He's very uh, particular about the way that he raises his family and supports his own family's health and all that type of stuff, which is in line with a lot of the stuff that I also would like to do with it once I have a family as well. Uh, so we'll be diving into that. We'll be diving into some non-negotiables when it comes to food and how to test for different food sensitivities and whatnot that could be impacting your body. So Dr. Hartman is a physician and he really got his first taste of functional medicine when it came down to figuring out his daughter's health problems and discovering that there was a lot of dietary issues that were causing some of the, the symptoms that she was experiencing. And now he helps patients identify leverage points in key areas of their lifestyle and health that harness their body's remarkable power to heal and begin living the vibrant life they deserve. So if you want to learn more about Dr. Hartman, you can go over to richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. And let's dive into my conversation with Dr. Hartman. Thank you, Aaron, for coming onto the show. Brian, it's great to be here. I'm very excited to chat with you because you have a lot of non-negotiable foods that we should not be eating in our diet. But before we start talking about, you know, clean foods to eat, let's learn a little bit more about you. What's your journey and what got you really interested in uh, changing people's foods? Well, I kind of start with my family um, and I'll start with my oldest daughter, Anna. We adopted her back 2006, 2007, and she has cerebral palsy. And so one of the first things we encountered was the um, one of the specialists, the GI doctor, telling us to put a feeding tube in her stomach so you can pour formula down and get her to grow. And it, my wife, who's a pediatric OT who works with kids with special needs, explained to me how the feeding tube would affect her speech, it would affect her crawling and her development. And so we just opted not to do that and just work on feeding her. And so we got in trouble with the uh, specialists and got reported and all that kind of fun stuff happened. But um, in, the, in the meantime, my wife found a pediatric growth chart for kids with CP. My daughter was right in the middle. And that was the first time that I realized, wait a second, there's more out there than you know the standard of care, so to speak. And that's what also got us down this whole, whole food route because we were giving her real food. We were making real nut nutrient-dense food. And we just kind of watched how over the years, it, it's changed her health, it's changed all of our kids. You know, my son, when we got him, he was six months old. He had bad eczema and bad allergies, terrible, greasy skin. And that's what happens when you feed a kid donut holes. And so we changed his diet, made homemade formula. Uh, my wife made homemade formula. <laughs> and um, totally changed the trajectory of our kids. And so as, as my practice has evolved and changed from a conventional family practice, you know, clinical research company, now you're doing functional medicine, I've realized that all these really cool biohacks and cool tricks and blue lipped muzzle and all this kind of extract and all that kind of stuff, it's all built on top of diet. If you don't have a really clean diet, 
um, that's nutrient dense, that's with healing foods, healthy fats, um, nutrient dense foods that's tailored to the individual based on their testing and their condition. Then all these other flourishes, they, they can be helpful, but they're not going to be as impactful if you don't, the foundational things are foundational. The main thing's still the main thing. And so I've kind of learned about that, how strong, how powerful diet is, but also how powerful all these other things can be on top of a really good foundation. So you said that you noticed some health changes were happening with your daughter and the son you talked about with eczema and whatnot, but for the daughter, how did you know what was changing? What, what, what were some of the things that changed? Well, okay. So when we got our daughter, um, she has cere cere um, severe cerebral palsy and um, we were told she had really bad um, mental retardation. She was never supposed to walk or talk or crawl. And so initially it was just, she'd sit in a bumbo and like hunched over and just um, wouldn't talk and just would be there. And so we saw slowly, she got more responsive, had more eye contact. And um, she's 15 now. She walks with forearm crutches. She loves playing chess and card games. She to be honest with you, won't stop talking. Um, it's kind of, it's like, please give me a second, a break. And she's still getting better. And, and for a kid with CP to be 15 and never have had a surgical procedure, never been hospitalized before, um, never had a cavity, and have had one antibiotic in her life. Um, that's unheard of. And all of our kids who we adopted at different stages, between all three of them, there's been no hospitalizations, no significant infections, one antibiotic between three kids and no cavities. And that, um, that's not because they came from um, these amazing pristine backgrounds. It's been basically the is it nature or nurture. In our case, it's been um, nurture. That is unbelievable. That's amazing that changing diet and a couple other things can make that much of an impact for someone. And just with her own progress, how much more progress do you think that she'll be able to make? I don't know. Um, her vision, I, I also do all these crazy biohack stuff. I started using different peptides and cerebral ice and we've done hyperbaric and, and all the cool stuff. You know, there's not probably a cool thing. We, we did Pons therapy, went up to Canada, um, to, um, uh, to Toronto, did Pons therapy, which is, which is an oral um, neuromuscular stimulation device that activates your midbrain through your tongue. Um, that's being used with MS and a bunch of traumatic brain injuries. So we've done a lot of cool things like that. So um so it's not just diet, right? It's diet plus all these cool tricks. But, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, my goal is for her to be able to live independently with minimal helps, to live a vibrant life, to have meaningful relationships, to get a basic job, whatever that means, to create value and impact those around her. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like for, for my daughter, but that's my goal for her. And she continues to progress. Um, she's now actually writing. She can actually write her name now. Um, which again, she was never supposed to do. So I just, I don't know. I don't know what my end goal is. My end goal is for, for those things. And um, I'm just not stopping learning and stopping doing new things um, with her. And, and it ultimately affects my patients because I learn things and I'm like, oh, this works well. I'm, I'm doing, you know, timeless and alpha one and TB4 and CHC from Maryland with dihexa for activation of, you know, BD, increasing your BDNF 10,000% with dihexa, which is a peptide. I'm doing all these cool things. And like, wait a second, I can use these for other patients as well. So so you had mentioned that you removed a lot of the processed foods out of your kid's mm. diet, and then you started adding in some real foods. Is there any specific dietary type that you follow more to, or is it just a mix of whole real foods? It's a mix. It depends. You know, it's a mix of whole real foods. It depends on the person's physiology. Like my daughter is a little double jointed, a little hypermobile. And people that are hypermobile need more vitamin C, more trace minerals, more kind of caveman kind of stuff, which means more organ meat, more healthy fats. Um, so we do a lot of crock pot cooking stuff. I make bone, I always have bone broth in the fridge um, to be used for any soups or anything. So um, it depends on the time of the year. Um, what time of the year, you know, in the wintertime, you want more fat, but where I'm at, it gets really cold. Well, not, not super cold, like maybe 20 or 30 degrees, but, um, and so if you want to stay warm in the wintertime, you need to eat enough fat for your body to burn and create heat. And so your diet should change throughout the year. So I kind of, the diet I adhere to is probably more like a whole food, like a real food diet, plant forward. Um, if I was to give it a title, I'd probably call it paleo-ish, um, um, you know, trying to think what to call it to give it a fancy name and trademark it right yeah but um <laughs> it's, it's just real food um that changes with the seasons variety nutrient dense and then certain tweaks based on the person and with my daughter and um it's been really lots of organ meats lots of nutrient dense stuff bone broth because ultimately with with my kids i'm healing brains 
I'm trying to remyelinate things. I'm trying to fix guts. And that requires a lot, of, a lot of healthy fats to flush out toxins, which is one thing I think with kids we overlook all the time is how important healthy fats are for brain development, gut health, immune function. Those, those are like the, un, in many ways, the unsung superfood that people just overlook are actually healthy fats. Are your kids homeschooled or are they in other schools? They're they're homeschooled. We've um my wife decided to stay home with them and homeschool them for many reasons. Um in hindsight, you know, we've it was actually a really good choice. We've been able to, to sail through a lot of the COVID stuff and all the other things relatively with my kids' education uns- unscathed and their sense of um security and well being and they're 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 happy kids. And that's um something I'm in my office I'm seeing a lot of kids with anxiety and stress and um it's it's concerning. Yeah, the reason I was at uh, asking that is a lot of times people might have healthy foods at home, but if their kids are away from them, you know, seven, eight hours yeah. a day and they're at school, they have a- access to all these other types of foods and all sorts of products. So in those situations, if you're trying to, you know, get your kids to eat the best type of foods possible, how do you manage their access in more public spaces like schools? I mean, you know, when we send them places, which we do, we would pack stuff with us. We take snacks. I mean, it got to the point in time where we'd go places and they, they have the little kitty snacks and we'd actually bring our own, you know, organic Newman's own raisins as a snack because we didn't want them given the other reason, raisins that actually had the corn syrup put on. I mean, why would you put corn syrup on raisins? I mean, they're, <laughs> I mean, right. And so we basically just take stuff with us, pre-pack it. When we go on vacations, we tend to like pre-cook food and take it with us. Um, it's a big investment. But it's an investment if that pays off, especially for your kid's health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question I had is when it comes to, you know, people picking on them because they always bring, uh, you know, like home lunches and et cetera like that, or just people bullying other people based off of the foods that they're eating. Your kids might not experience that, but maybe some of your other Mm -hmm. patients have. What do you do in those situations? You got to turn into a game, you know, to be honest with you and just um, educate your kids why they're doing what they do. Um, Because ultimately kids can be really mean regardless. I mean, kids are going to pick on kids because that's what kids do. I mean, I'm not sure I was picked on as a kid. I actually realized a couple of years ago when all the bond as a kid, I actually realized a couple of years ago when all the elementary school and I just kind of went with the flow. I didn't realize that that was, you know, I was oblivious to it and um, it just happens. So that's where you prepare your kids, educate them, say, Hey, you know, um, ultimately you're educating them so they can make, when they move out of their home, they can make their own, um, personal decisions. My oldest daughter is 15, my second's 14 and my 14 year old's now going out and doing things with friends. And it's like, we have to hope that she has learned enough to make really good decisions. And it's really interesting with our daughters, like when they eat really good, um, their cycles are great. They have like a three day cycle, no problem. And when they eat poorly, they have painful cycles and lay in bed for a couple of days. And it's, it's a, sometimes when the kid you when you educate your kids they kind of see the correlation and so they say wait a second I ate bad now I'm it's having a lot of pain for the next couple of days you know um, just educating them doing the best we can and just um, realizing that we're we're all going to be picked on some point in time we just need to have enough resilience to kind of take it with stride. Now trans transitioning into working with adults adults that. The point you probably see them, they've already formulated opinions. They already have uh, certain dietary habits that are really ingrained in their daily routines, etc. The patients that you're working with, I don't know if they're coming to you um, after seeing a lot of different people or if you're their general practitioner or what it is, but how difficult is it to get them to make dietary changes? I think it's health. It's difficult for a lot of people. You know, you um, you have a family, you have a spouse, and so someone comes to me and they're like, "Well, I'm all in, but my spouse isn't, and my kids aren't. My kids are 15. They're gonna bring what they want to bring." And I've got a patient who, everybody, you know, brings Coke and pop into the house, processed food, and it's like she's got chronic fatigue and fibro and like some autoimmune issues, and it's like it's hard. And so that's where um, idea of the whole family would be involved. And that's where if you have, you start young with the kids when they're young enough, they don't know any better that, you know, Hey, you know, homemade granola is actually great. Let's do that. You know, which is the homemade granola I make is, is grain free. It's like all nuts and stuff, but it gets hard. It's difficult. And it's an educational process. And people have to believe that when I say half of all chronic disease in our country can be directly related to eating processed foods, you know, I try to lay out the information to educate people, but it's not just the, the not just the head knowledge. People ultimately have to, in their heart have to know and learn and, and experience 
how they feel when they eat real food. And some people, unfortunately, will have that experience and um, won't accept it. They'll kind of go back to their what they want to do, what's easier. I have I have one patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, and you know she um it just it's she'll do great. Like do like a seven day juice fast, eat really great. All of her rheumatoid symptoms go away. Her RA factors coming down, her anti CCPs coming down, and every three or four months, hers coming down, her anti CCPs coming down, and every three or four months, what do you call it? A craving, go eat a bunch of donuts and have a flare, and that happens pretty like clockwork every three to four months. Since like, and she's seen the results. It happens pretty like clockwork every three to four months. Since like, and she's seen the results. Wants some donuts. Since like, how do I come along alongside those people and just be like, be there and give them a plan, um, and, and work with them? My concern is there might be a point in time when a simple seven to ten day juice fast won't get her out of the rheumatoid. And I have other patients like that who it's like we're doing harder core stuff. Um, to calm their immune systems down. So it's just education and being there and just guiding people and realizing everybody makes their own decisions, their own choices. And I'm people's consultant. I'm their guide. You know, I just kind of do the best I can. And I'm there. I think that's one thing with patients. They realize I'm not going anywhere. I'm not judging them based on their choices. Um, and I'm going to do the best I can regardless to um, help them with their health. Awesome. Now, when it comes to people <clears throat> coming in, uh, Regardless of where they're starting at, what are some absolutely non-negotiables when it comes to food that they should take out of their diet? You know, processed food, fake food, you know, so that which is a big, big category, right? So within that processed fake food thing, the first thing I say is, is processed oils. If I was really look at, you know, you look at grains and carbs and look at how harmful trans fats are, um, hydrogenate oils, you know, think about it. It's what the, my computer is plastic. What is plastic? Plastic is liquid petroleum that we plasticize. We turn it into a solid object. That's what hydrogenization is. That's what trans fats are. They're partially plasticized liquids, right? That's insane. You get those in your cells. And it makes your cells not vibrate as well. It makes your receptors not work as well. If I was to pick one thing to work on first, it's going to be like sugar and oils. And it depends on the patient. If you're more inflamed autoimmune, I might do the sugars first, you know, gut issues. If you have more um, immune dysregulation issues, I might do more the, the fats first, getting the healthy fats in, the bad fats out. But that's kind of where I start. And once you get the healthy oils and the bad oils out and you remove the sugar, then you start working on the, pro- the next process level, which are all the grains, the carbs, the wheat, the, the soy, um, corn, you know, um, I will, you know, right. You can't, you can't actually get good quality rice and do it, do it better. But if someone's trying to heal themselves, you want to remove all inflammatory foods, um, which I know is difficult. So in that case, if we're kind of working on things, I'll focus on again, the fats, sugar, then like your big processed grains, like the big wheat, soy, corn, and then kind of like get to some of the other things, depending on where the patient's at. Have you seen the, the, how it's made video on how canola oil is made? I've not I've not heard about that one, but I've seen multiple different videos about oil in general. And you know, it's called rapeseed oil, and they they deodorize it with a solvent. I mean, <laughs> and the thing the thing that people talk about about these oils is when they they typically process and they use a pressurization process. I'm not sure if the video you're referring to shows like the smoke coming off mm. of it. Does it show that? Okay, well that that is actually you're burning the fat. It's like you're cooking with um, butter at your stovetop and you kind of smoke the smoke point. You're hitting the smoke point for these omega-3s and 6s. So you basically have turned them into burnt, charred, fat. fat. Um, they are very inflammatory and very toxic. And so literally in that process, it's not just separating getting the oil out. You're actually burning it before you even consume it. And that's what makes those things even worse. Yeah, in the video I'm talking about, uh, you see at some point the byproduct is just absolutely this nasty, gunky paste. And that's essentially what could be going on inside of your body if you're consuming a lot of this stuff is you're getting all this gunked up junk that's very hard to process and push through your system. Yeah. There's one interesting yeah. study I was looking at. I was looking at heart attack incidents, and there's a close correlation with the large consumption of processed oils the night before a heart attack. And I was looking at people eating out and having heart attacks the day after eating out because most of the oils that are used in the restaurant business are canola, soy that's processed. Even the olive oil is usually cut with some kind of canola or soy oil. It's not 100% extra virgin. Yeah. Yeah, and it's cheap to make. And so restaurants yeah. are typically going to use something cheap because they're going through a lot of it too. Well, a lot of those, um, a lot of those oils are un, they're deodorized, so they don't have a flavor. So it makes it for the chef. The chef actually doesn't have to be as specific. You know, when you use olive oil or coconut oil, it has a flavor in it, and you have to use it the right way, right? 
like using a coconut oil with a white fish gives it a nice flavor. You know, taking your vegetables with olive oil, you can spice it up with curry, right? When you have these deodorized oils, all of a sudden the chef doesn't have to be as exacting with his science because he's using a deodorized, uh, de de detasted product. You know. Yep, uh, kind of along the same lines, but just changing products from how they should be. Um, uh, honey, raw honey is not always what you would expect it to be. A lot of times, a lot of those commercial honey products mm. are cut with uh, high fructose corn syrup. And what they do is they put out giant barrels of high fructose corn syrup out into the fields and let the, the bees go and um, harvest it, bring it back to the hive. Once it's in the hive and they extract it, it's considered honey. Doesn't matter that it was originally mm -hmm. high fructose corn syrup. So it's we've got stuff like that. And then you also have the whole one thing I didn't realize <clears throat> the um honey world's almost like the olive world. Olive world, we have like, you know, the really good stuff, and you got these like these black market stuff. And there's a mm -hmm. huge amount of um mixed um high fructose corn syrup and honey oil coming from China that gets shipped to the Philippines and other countries, and then it becomes not from Chinese origin, but from the Philippines or Taiwan or um Vietnam. And so I think honey's one of those things. I don't trust it like unless it's local. I mean with honey, yep. I'm like, you know, I want to know where is a farm in that state or if there's Canadian can honeys that like are coming from a farm. Because it's so easy to adulterate it. Either I knew I wasn't aware of what you're referring to. That's even a better way because you can have you know organic wild caught honey that's literally, you know, I, I actually have bees myself. I have I have some hives. Same. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And so I just got my first and so I'm like, I got two on the hives I'm building up right now. So I am supplementing them right now to get them through the first winter, you know, and you, and you'll use, um, sugar that you melt with water. And so the honey in those combs literally is just, that's all it is. You know, um, people, yep. it's, it's hopefully in the spring, we'll get some yummy honey though. But so, yeah, it's uh once you harvest your own fresh honey, it's unbelievable. Really? And the amount of work and time that you put into it and the extraction process, you just really, really appreciate it. But yeah, a lot of times to help them get through the winter, you have to supplement and, yeah. <clears throat> you know, give them a little boost. And then like my bees, I even, I've got a couple boxes of, um, a couple brood boxes full of honey right now on them. But then I also throw like a sugar patty on top as yeah. well. So if they do eat through all the honey, which they shouldn't, but if they do, then they're snacking on that as well. But that's just one of the byproducts of us taking some honey from them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to make like actually a couple of sugar pies myself uh, this week. So yep. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. Yep. Well, so you, you said you have bees and I'm assuming you have a decent amount of space or land that you're living on. Are you also growing your own food then? Yeah, we, we're, we're weird. We, um, my wife and I, we take things a little to extreme and I recognize that. So we actually have a little farm outside of Richmond. We've got like, uh, some land and we have cows, we have chickens. So we do our own eggs. Uh, we do our own beef. Um, I supplement my cows. I've actually studied, a, um, appropriate, um, agriculture for cows. So I supplement my cows with kelp. So I use that as a mineral supplement to maximize their health. Um, we have some fruit trees. Um, haven't been super successful with that just cause I haven't spent the time. I do do some mushroom foraging. We actually have, um, lion's mane pretty readily available on our property about this time of year. So, um, so we just kind of, and my kids are just learning like, Hey, this is how, this is real, real food comes from, you know, this is how it works. And so they kind of have an appreciation for real food, you know, which is, it's amazing how many people don't know how to cook these days. You know, I remember watching a leave it when I was a kid, a leave it to beaver um, episode and Joan, this is back in the day in the fifties. I know and think times have changed. I recognize that, but Joan was getting ready to start dinner. And so it's three o'clock in the afternoon. She went into the fridge, pulled out a big old thing, of a bone put in the pot and started boiling water. I'm like, that was normal enough in the fifties that you could put that on a TV show and no one would think twice about it. You know, now no one knows how to cook. We're so used to like processed foods. And it's just a different, I want my kids appreciate that. And I think that by itself is worth all the, the stuff we've done to give our kids this interesting experience. So you said you supplement uh, kelp with your cows. Is that for like iodine or what's that for? So, um, no, so in, I, one of the things I do is I learn from everything, right? So I learn from my cows, and it's interesting. There's um, about 98 um, plus or minus um, trace minerals in fescue or grass that are critical for cows' health. And if you have a cow that's fed grain, so you get sick cows. Not only do they become pre-diabetic and get the marbling, which is yummy, but it's a sign of pre-diabetes, right? Fatty infiltration of your liver is called fatty liver disease. You see it in people with metabolic syndrome. 
And a cow, we say, hmm, yummy, right? So I kind of learned that was a bad thing. And I learned also about the trace minerals. And so um, sometimes when people do organic cows, they won't give them antibox. And the cows can get like an eye infection from flies and they'll go blind, right? Well, what I learned from Joe Salatin, who's like one of the premier organic farmers um, in the English-speaking world, he actually lives here in Virginia, is that he started supplementing with kelp, which is a nutrient-dense product of trace minerals, right? It's got all the trace minerals because it's basically the land bringing the minerals into the water. It concentrates, then the kelp concentrates in there. I mean, that's that's kind of how that, that whole process works, that he has not had a cow go blind in over 20 years. So I'm like, well, let me, I don't, I don't want to afford an expensive vet bill. I want my cows to be happy and healthy. And I want the byproducts of, their, of, of them to be healthy. So I started supplementing with um, kelp. And our first cow we processed, I noticed how deep red the meat was. And so the reason we our, our supplement is one, for the health of the cow. And two, it's the byproduct. Ultimately, you, you eat what you ate, ate. And the more healthy the cows and the chickens are, the more healthy the eggs and the meat is going to be, or the dairy or whatever, depending on what you're eating. So, um, so I've also carried that into my human health because um, many Americans are trace mineral deficient because our foods are processed because we eat processed, we drink processed water. Everything's processed. And we talk about magnesium and potassium, but who talks about strontium for bones and silica and boron and all these crazy trace minerals? We don't even know what half of them do. We just know if you don't get them, you increase your risk for chronic illnesses. That. I was going to ask you if you've gone over and hung out with Joel Salatin at all, because you're right there. So, Oh, yes, yes. yes. He's actually come to Richmond, and he's got his little farm. And, you know, and when we run out of eggs, I'll actually order eggs from him and on Polyface and pick them up locally. He actually does a, a, a drop-off in Richmond, 10 or 20 of them, put them in a freezer to last us for a bit. So, yeah. So you got like a whole little homestead going on there. Do you also have a greenhouse where you're growing food all year? No, that's I. I've, I this, this is my hobby. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, so like you know, we have a garden, and basically halfway through every summer, the garden gets overgrown with stuff because I get on call. I work too long. We take a vacation. I come back. It gets overgrown. So, we have yet to have like an amazing um garden. You know, we usually have tomatoes, and that's about it. And maybe some squash. So um, hopefully I'll have a little more spare time as I get a little older to have a good garden. But the greenhouse is like the next level of um, work, which I just don't have the margin for mm-hmm. right now. That, that'd be one of my dreams is to get a little older and have some spare time so I can start doing that <laughs> stuff then. So unfortunately, not, not everyone on this planet can have, you know, a little bit of land to raise their own cows and all that type of stuff. So what are some good strategies for people to mm-hmm. get good quality foods and pretty much know that it's coming from uh, healthy sources without all these extra processing and... Uh, drugs and antibiotics and all that type of stuff being added to them. I mean, you really need to research your local environment. You know, for my patients, I've actually put together a food sourcing guide for the Richmond marketplace where it's like, if you want beef, this is where you get beef from. This is where you get your chicken from. You know, there's a place called Fall Line Farms here, which, and if, look for your local CSA, you know, look for what's your local community support agriculture. Is there, you know, local farmers markets. I don't assume all of them do things the right way, but that's a really good starting point. And you talk with your farmer, hey, you know, with your chicken, everybody supplements their chicken with feed. You can't have eggs or meat without. What kind of feed do you supplement with? Is it mainly a soy based? Is it, you know, is it organic versus not organic? You know, is it a fish meal? You know, the, the, we use Sunrise Farms as our our, our um, chicken feed, and they actually have um, a chicken feed where they use fish as a sort of basic ground fish. It's this little small mackerel like thing that's actually caught down South America, and they, it's a throwaway fish. But they'll grind it up and put it in chicken feed and animal feed, and so like I'll get that in my chicken feed. You know, you can talk with your farmers and find out what they're doing they're, If people are doing things the right way, they're proud of it. And they will tell you, you know, Al, Alfredo, who's a, who's a bee guy around here, you know, asking about his honey, you can be there for 30 minutes as he talks about the little bees and how beautiful they are. And they do their dance. And, and he's from, um, I think he's from Argentina, maybe and he's like passionate about his bees and people that do things the right way are passionate about. So just find those local resources, you know, I've, and then there's also things like, you know, Costco, Costco is a great place to get um, Alaskan salmon that's affordable year round. You know, um, they actually have a, they're a really good source for organic. Like um, you can actually get um, raw, you know, comte as a fr- as a raw French cheese. You can get Gruyere, Swiss Gruyere, which is another t- really good European cheese from from Costco. So they're just find your local resources, support your local agriculture, but also realize you know olive oil can be kind of pricey. You know, we have a local place um, the um, 
the olive oil tap room where I'll get like the really high quality stuff. But when I run out, I will, you know, Costco has really good Tunisian olive oil they've they've sourced into a gun job with as well. So just find your local sources and and research it. You know, it took us a year and a half to figure out where to get stuff from. And so that's a starting point, you know, starting with the most important things. And we have resources that we provide patients online and things like that for how do you do that. And there's a you know, Thrive Markets, one one place where people can order stuff. But you just have to get educated, you know, um, and just know your local environment. You know, you it's you gotta be careful though, because it can it can, can get probably kind of pricey. So if you find one place, and I don't want to make any mention, any names or any place in one trip, whole you know. So uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, whole paycheck, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But that's where also growing stuff at home, you know, you can, everybody can grow something. You can do tomatoes. They have these upside down tomato plants mm. you can grow that just, you can do tomatoes. You can do something. Herbs are really easy to do at home. We have a little, in the wintertime, our, our plants in, the, in the, the windows, you know, so everybody can do a little something just to get started. And, and look, you want tomatoes to go with that basil. So you get your little tomato plant. And you're like, wait a second, this is easy. Can I do some squash? And it'll, it'll kind of naturally kind of grow with some simple stuff. You know, it's super easy to have your own arugula in your backyard or in a little side. Do a, ra- a raised bed garden. You can have a small six by um, uh, three by six or three by nine raised bed garden, um, and you can grow a lot of stuff in that. Yep. Yeah, we have um, one of those little aero gardens, which is those hydroponics that you just plug in and the light comes on 16 hours a day and you can grow food right in there. And then we use organic fertilizers instead of the stuff that they give you. So we get uh, fresh, mm-hmm. some fresh veggies that way all year long. And uh, so we usually use that with veggies that when we put it outside, the deer and stuff will come and just demolish it, the slugs especially. So we just grow that stuff inside. Nice. So there's, and that doesn't take up that much room inside either. So there's mm-hmm. definitely ways to grow stuff inside if you don't have the room outside. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's more and more options to do that in an easy way. Like I I almost never touch the arrow garden. Mm-hmm. I just have to clean the water once a month mm-hmm. and it does its own thing. That's so. Cool. It's it's pretty nice. Yeah, I, mean, I think just using also just supporting your local farmers markets and your local agriculture because ultimately the thing about it is that it, these businesses require people to buy their products in order for them to be successful. And so, if you want really high quality food, I mean, you go to Spain, you go to France, like they're like this is where this is the fishmonger, this is where you buy a fish. This is the cheesemonger, this is where you get cheese, right? This is the bakery, this is where you get your fresh bread. In France. You know, you don't ask for a croissant at three o'clock in the afternoon or don't ask for an old one because they're like, no, yesterday's croissants are for yesterday. Today's croissants are for today. They take pride in that stuff, you know, but it's coming from very local. And so it's thinking more locally and supporting these local businesses as best you can, as well as you can. Um, we'll just make that available, not only to yourself, but to others and probably your kids in the future as well, hopefully. Yep. And not only that, but you're also supporting your local community. You're reducing your carbon footprint and all sorts of stuff. So it's a lot better to stay as local as possible. Plus your body is adapted to your local environment. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting stuff locally too, that should be more beneficial to your body and the the climate that you're in as well. Well, What's interesting. We mentioned that um, like the whole idea of the bacteria in the soil, like if you pull stuff out of your garden, you're going to be getting bacteria in the soil and your local soil and that that actually gets in your gut. And there's this interesting, interesting study looking at women who are breastfeeding who like, would eat fresh uncooked vegetables would actually secrete the bacteria from the food they ate in the breast milk to go to the baby. And like, there's this really super close connection with us in the, in our environment and soil. You know, there's a guy called Sir Albert Howard. He was a, um, I think he was a, uh, a British entomologist, um, as part of the, the, the British empire before world war two. And he wrote a book called soil and health. And he goes across like how, soil bacteria and fungi and the healthy soil results in healthy plants, results in healthy animals, and then healthy humans who eat those things. And it's this whole process, you know, it's um it's actually fascinating. It's crazy, crazy, ridiculously um complex. And if you do things the right way, it can be super great for your health as well. Mm. Well, Aaron, are there any final things you want to make sure we cover when it comes to clean eating and um, just eating really good foods? I think just start where you can. You know, people get often get overwhelmed by, well, I can't get, I'm not going where you can. You know, people get often get overwhelmed by, well, I can't get, I'm not going a little weird, but people can can choose healthy oils. They can start there. They can get rid of sugars. They can, or they can use real sugar, use real honey, raw honey, use, um, Real, real brown sugar, use just grains. They can do these things slowly. 
and just picking one or two things and doing it slowly. I think that's the the um the um the, the biggest message to people is don't get overwhelmed, don't let it get to you. It, it took it took me. This is my job. This is my calling. And it took me a year and a half just to figure out where to buy stuff. So if it took me that long to figure it out, it's going to take a bit for to the typical person. So just go with it. You know, the, the tourist wins the race, right? And so you don't want to start fast. You want to, you want to, you want to stay, stay even, burn clean, stay even. And that's how you'll, you'll slowly over time develop healthy habits that will last with you for a lifetime. If you're on a limited budget, what are some of the first things you should swap? Um, Limited budget, probably the, the, um, I would say like your um, your your um, microwavable meals, those kind of things. You can swap them out, and you can like I know people want carbs, like say they want to swap that out. Well, what do I do now? You can get you know organic brown rice. You can get quinoa. You can get lentils. Those are cheap. You can get organic spinach lentils. They aren't expensive. Take your leftover bones, make your own bone broth, and now you've basically got mineral infused whatever, rice, quinoa, lentils. They now have lots of fiber, lots of protein, okay? Those are, those are some basic things you can do if you're on a budget because tip, people typically do lots of carbs in their own budget and then spend more of your money on your clean meats, you know? Spend your money on your clean meats and then just be smarter with your carbs. Well, Aaron, my final question for you is what is your vision of what healthy looks like and what are three things you do daily to reach that vision? My vision of healthy is having the energy to do what I want to do, um, the strength to withstand you know, life stressors, and the ability to be there for my family um, long term. And so daily, what I try to do is try to get enough sleep, because that's a huge thing that we all need to work on. Uh, try to um, eat real food and, and do something like meditative, prayer, contemplative on a daily basis just to kind of keep myself um, balanced. You know, that's your stress, your sleep, and your diet. You know, I call it my triangle of health is what I call it. These are the things that if you do consistently and regularly, you almost guarantee maximal health in the future. I mean, if you look at blue zones, this is what people in blue zones do. This is Polynesian Island in the middle of the um, Atlantic where 80% of the adults smoke there. No heart disease, no cancer. You know, Healthy living is literally so powerful. It can counteract the badness of smoking. And that just blows my mind. That's how powerful stress, sleep, and food can be. They smoke and they drink, but they don't have an increased risk of heart disease. Why? All these soft, soft things that you got to do every day on a regular basis. So that would not be my thought on that. Awesome. Well, people can find you at richmondfunctionalmedicine.com. You're also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And you also have an ebook that's available for people and it's free. Can you talk about it? Yeah, so the ebook um actually spurned out of the whole COVID thing when people were like, why are people getting sick? What can you do? So I put something together, um, roadmap to resilience. Like, what things can you do to prepare your immune system to maximally withstand the stress of life? So I basically took the foundations of functional medicine and put it into an ebook that walks people through diet, stress, sleep, all these basic concepts, and it has ref and has references to resources. Um, on my website, so it will refer to like an elimination diet if you have gut issues or whatnot. So uh, it's a nice starting point for people to start starting to try to wrap their brain around how do I make myself maximally resilient? You know. Awesome. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for coming onto the show and talking us through all of this. You're a good human. You're in it for the people and helping people out, and I really appreciate that. And I hope people will listen to this and start looking locally to get very good, clean, healthy foods for them. And Brian, I really appreciate you inviting me on um, your show to share with um, share with everybody. So I appreciate that. I hope you were able to learn quite a bit from Dr. Hartman. We had a really good conversation after this episode about raising your own food, growing your own food, uh, honeybees, all sorts of stuff that you can do just to help your own food quality and to help out your local area as well. Um, so if you do have space, you do have the room and the land to be able to do that, then that should make uh, your access to high quality foods a lot easier than some people that might not have that space. So just keep that in mind that you can definitely utilize the land that you have to uh, grow high quality food for you and your family. So if you want to learn more about him, head on over to richmondfunctionalmedicine.com and we'll have resources to everything we talked about in this episode's show notes at summitforwellness.com slash 166. Next week, we have Devin Burke on the show. Let's go learn who he is and what we'll be talking about. I am here with Devin Burke. Hey, Devin, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? I got through college being a bar mitzvah dancer. 
<laughs> You're going to have to explain that one a little bit more. Okay. I'm sure there's lots of people that want to know more about that one. So technically, I was a, I was a professional dancer um, that I would be hired to go to these high-end you know, um, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, sweet 16s, and, and dance with the older ladies uh, as well as the, the younger ladies uh, and get the party started. So that was, that was a fun job. And uh, not a lot of people know that, but now they do. <laughs> now they do. Well, what will we be learning about in our interview together? So the, it, this interview is really about how do you optimize sleep? How do you, how do you make the one third of your life that you spend in bed make the other two thirds extraordinary? And we talk a lot about you know, the techniques, the strategies, the tools, the mindsets around how to do just that. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Greens, 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 greens. I think that's the number one thing missing. So anything green, bok choy, kale, chard, um, spirulina, chlorella, uh, you know, anything that's green. I think people, that's, we just don't eat enough green food. So I try to have something green every day, whether it's broccoli or spinach or a big salad or, you know, some kind of supplement with it's green. Um, anything green, green juice, green smoothies, just get the greens in. And what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? I would say optimize your sleep. That's you're going to before anything, whether it's nutrition or, you know, exercise, focus on your sleep, because if you're not sleeping well, then you're sacrificing in those other areas. Um, number two, I would say get support. Don't try to do this on your own. Find somebody or a group or a person to learn from to accelerate the process or potentially work with whatever area of health that you, you want. Don't try to do it by yourself. A big mistake. Cut the learning curve. There's people that have studied this for a lifetime and can help you accelerate the process. Number three, I would say have a mindfulness practice. I think just it, you know, my, having some type of meditation, daily meditation practice is life changing. It'll change your life if you commit to it. And, um, and those are my three. I have said it many times in episodes before, sleep is extremely important for our health, but it also seems like it's one of the first things that we neglect, which can lead to a lot of health outcomes. So until next time, keep climbing to the peak of your health.